Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Today I'd like to continue our discussion on frequency domain analysis and do a quick video here on the resonant frequency of a dynamic system. Now, in our last video here, you'll remember that we introduced the concept of Bode plots and we showed how they were a great tool to visualize the frequency response of a system by basically graphically representing how the amplification as well as the phase shift of a dynamic system was related to the input frequency of the excitation here. So we saw that you might get Bode plots, you know, it could look like, I don't know, I'm making this up here, but again, we saw that what this Bode plot represented here was how much did the system amplify or attenuate the input signal as a function of input frequency, as well as how much of the, uh, how much phase shift was introduced to that system. Now. I don't know about you, but one of the first things that I think about when I see a plot like this here is the natural question to me would be is at what frequency do we obtain the largest output amplification here, right? And this is known as omega r or your resonance frequency, right? So again, the Bode plot is a real good way to visualize that because you can graphically see and you can see why this makes sense here. Resonance is just talking about what frequency do you need to drive the system at to get the largest outputs. Now, we gotta be a little bit careful here because a lot of times uh, you may hear the term resonant frequency and natural frequency used sort of interchangeably here. And you have to be careful because it depends who you're talking to. If you're talking to a controls engineer, uh, natural frequency means something very specific. But if you're talking with someone else in another field of engineering, resonance frequency, natural frequency, damp natural frequency, maybe these all mean the same thing. But us as controls engineers, we need to be a little bit more precise. So in order to uh, suss that out a little bit, why don't we take a look at a standard second order system and we'll write this down mathematically and we'll show that actually the natural frequency is not the same thing as the resonance frequency and it's not the same thing as a damp natural frequency as we've seen earlier, okay? So to, to illustrate that, let's go ahead and just consider a standard second order system, right? So a second order system here, again, let's use our transfer function representation of this. If you have a second order system, there exists this concept of natural frequency and damping ratio, right? So the natural frequency and damping ratio were these constants where if you write the denominator in con uh, standard form of two times zeta times omega n s plus omega n squared. And for let's just go ahead and make the DC gain of this system one here. So the the, the numerator really doesn't matter, but I'm just going to make this uh, equal to omega n squared just so that the DC gain is 1. Again, that doesn't matter. What we really care about is the natural frequency and the damping ratio down here, okay? So here's our standard second order system, okay? Now, what we might be interested in doing here is getting a Bode plot for this system here, right? So in order to do that, what I'm going to first do is calculate the uh, frequency response by basically, um, again, Everywhere you see an S, plug in J omega. So what I want now here is I'm going to subject system to U of T is equal to A sine omega T. So a sinusoidal input here, right? And we saw that, okay, the frequency response of this system is basically given by the first thing I need to do here is calculate G of J omega here, right? So everywhere you see an S, plug in J omega here, okay? So I think that's pretty simple. You get omega N squared, and then you get J omega squared plus two times zeta times omega N times J omega plus omega N squared, okay? And you see, you end up again with what we discussed earlier. This is just some imaginary number. So you go and you, you, you expand the denominator, you multiply the numerator and denominator by its complex conjugate, and you do a little bit of algebra here. And I'm going to skip all the boring algebra because that's not terribly important here. But you would basically get this thing to look like a real part plus an imaginary part. Okay? And... Let's just write down for, for giggles here what this alpha and beta are here. So alpha, it's going to look like this ugly expression here. It's going to be omega n to the fourth 
minus omega n squared times omega squared. And again, be careful of the difference between omega n, which is just the natural frequency of the system, and omega, which is the frequency of the input excitation that we're examining here, right? Okay, so it's this all over. The denominator is a little bit ugly here. It's omega to the fourth minus two omega squared omega n squared plus four times zeta squared omega squared omega n squared plus omega n to the fourth ugly here right okay that's alpha and now beta here it's the same number or sorry the, a different numerator here so it's two zeta omega omega n squared all over the same denominator so i'm just going to write it like this here the denominator is the same here but long story short here is the real part and here is the imaginary part of that complex number, and we see that they are functions of omega here, right? Okay, so to try to figure out uh, resonance frequency, right, I want to get this amplification graph, right? And we saw earlier that this is really nothing more than the magnitude of g of j omega, right? I guess it's 20 times log base 10 of that if you really want to measure it in decibels, but if all I care about is the is the, the frequency which yields the maximum, let's just get an expression for magnitude of G of, J, G of J omega because we saw earlier that that was our actual amplification factor here, right? So what I want to calculate here is I want to go ahead and get magnitude of G of J omega, right? So this is just magnitude of an imaginary number. Here's my imaginary number, alpha plus beta. So again, this is nothing more than square root of alpha squared plus beta squared, right? And that's something ugly here. So I actually, I think what I want to do now is jump over to Mathematica here because I really don't want to do all of this here on the board here. Um, and what we're going to end up with here is we're going to end up with some expression or some function, but we're going to see that it's a function of what? It's going to be a function of omega, omega n, and zeta, right? Okay, um, Okay. so why don't we jump over to uh, Mathematica here and uh, find out what this function f looks like. All right, so here we are in Mathematica, and the first thing we want to do here is input those, uh, let's call them ugly, <laughs> expressions for alpha and beta, right, which were the real and imaginary components of that uh, complex number. And just so I don't screw up the input here, I've actually got them prepared already off screen, so I'll just copy and paste them in. These are these expressions we wrote up on the board here. So let's go ahead and just shift enter and get those in. Okay, so now that we have the uh, the real and imaginary parts here, we want to go ahead and compute the magnitude, right? We want basically g of j, uh, magnitude of g of j omega, right? Which we said was basically alpha squared plus beta squared, ah, uh, come on, beta squared square rooted here, right? So let's just make another variable. I'm going to call this, how about magnitude of g of j uh, omega, which is going to be a function of omega here, right? And we said that this is basically alpha squared plus beta squared to the one half, right? So shift enter that here. And that's something kind of ugly. Maybe let's see if we can simplify this a little bit. Um, okay, not so bad. Okay, so this is basically the equation of the um, magnitude plot for the Bode plot, right? So just to refresh your memory here, whoops, let me grab this over here. And you know, this is what it should probably look like for some type for a given omega n and for a given zeta here. You know, you've got some plot here where we saw in our last video that there's some peak frequency, and this is actually what we're interested in, right? We want to know where's this peak here, uh, where what frequency yields the largest output uh, deflections here, right? So one way you can think about this here is, you know what? This maximum occurs where the derivative of the of the of the the derivative of the uh, plot here where it is equal to zero here right so I need to take the derivative of this line with respect to Omega and then try to solve for when Omega is equal to zero right okay so let's go ahead and do that right now here so let's go ahead and compute basically I want this term right but I want to take its derivative with respect to Omega here Right, I need to compute this here, and then find. Well, I'll tell you what. Let, let, let's just compute that first here, right? So let's do something like I don't know. Let's call it d mag g of j omega 
d omega <laughs> again that's kind of an ugly variable name but that's what I'm trying to do I'm trying to compute the slope again it's gonna be a function of omega here so I need to take the derivative of the magnitude of g of j omega and I need to take its derivative with respect to omega here right so that's what we end up with again ugly expression here and I'm gonna go slash slash let's simplify this thing here okay and we get something that's a little bit ugly here and now what I need to do is I need to find out where the slope is zero here so it's actually a little bit hard to do but tell you what let's write down what we're trying to do right now so I need to solve for when this thing right equals zero here right so you could try to go ahead and say whoops solve the slope is equal to zero solve this for omega right that's what we're trying to do here but um, it's a little bit too complicated to do that here but what we can do here is you see here we can show here that we talked about this earlier some people say that the natural frequency is the same thing as a resonance frequency well is that the case here we can evaluate what is the derivative here at omega n and if you input that look at this that definitely is not zero here right so that tells me for a fact here that well omega n is not the resonance frequency right so let me just make a small comment here right note that omega n is not the resonant frequency right omega n does not yield the maximum uh, amplification here the slope is not zero there let's also refresh our memories here and show that the damp natural frequency if you remember here our damp natural frequency was the frequency of free oscillation here for a second order system in other words if you were to just uh, start a second order system oscillating by itself here due to initial conditions it would oscillate at this frequency right we said in one of our previous discussions we showed that the damp natural frequency or the frequency of oscillation was basically omega n times square root of one minus zeta squared here we can show that that also doesn't work here so what I want to do here is do this times 1 minus zeta squared to the 1 half slash s simplify so again here we go we see that again this is not zero here so both the natural frequency and the damp natural frequency are not equal to the um, to, to the resonance frequency right as control engineers we see that these are very different things here okay so what you can do is we can show that the peak occurs at actually what you're looking for again we call it omega r here right so omega r w is actually going to be omega n it's actually going to look very similar to your damp natural frequency but except there's a factor of two difference here there should be a factor of two here okay so this is the resonant frequency here right let's just make a note this is the resonant frequency okay and how can we show that that's true well what we need to do here is basically evaluate this thing at the resonant frequency so tell you what first let's go ahead and make a let's make a variable called omega r because this thing is so important right whoops sorry I've got cap locks on omega r right so we said that is omega n times 1 minus 2 times zeta squared and you take the square root of this whole thing right this is theoretically the uh, resonance frequency so to, sh to show that's the case here let's evaluate what is the slope here at this resonance frequency and if we simplify this expression yay we get a zero so we see here that this is actually the resonance frequency um, for our system here okay so I'll tell you what let's hop back over to the board here and do a little bit of analysis on this resonance frequency okay so we saw that the resonance frequency or omega r was basically going to be given by your natural frequency times square root of 1 minus 2 times zeta squared here right okay now what's interesting about this is if you look at this long enough you see that in order for omega r to be real this term has to be positive right so in order for omega r to be real right we need 1 minus 2 zeta squared to be uh, greater than basically zero here right greater than or equal to I guess greater than or equal to zero right okay so um, if you can basically work this out what do we end up with 2 zeta squared here so this is 1 half greater than or equal to zeta squared here okay so basically we see that in order for it to be real 
your damping ratio has to be less than or equal to one over root two. And this is sometimes, you know, I think if you numerically work this out, it's like 0 0.707 here, right? So this is actually another interesting spot to maybe stop and have a little discussion on terminology here, right? This is sometimes referred to as critically damped. Right, so uh, a damping ratio of 0.707 or one over root two is sometimes referred to as critically damped here, depending on who you're talking to, right? If you talk to some other people, some people might call zeta equal to one to be critically damped. Right, again, it just depends on your context. Some people might like this discussion here because the solutions to your differential equations when you have zeta equal to one or greater don't have sinusoids in it, right? And in this case, you still have a sinusoidal excite um, um, uh, solution to your differential equation. However, we see that there are not gonna be any peaks in your Bode plot here. So there's not gonna be any amplification of the system. The system is still going to have sinusoidal outputs, but they're just all gonna be attenuated here. So we see that in this case, when we're talking about resonance frequency, we're really talking about zeta is equal to one over root two to be this critical cutoff point here where we have this uh, this this amplification or not present here, right? So maybe to, to, to drive this home, let's look at an example here, right? And I wanna look at that exact same example we've been using for the last two videos where we discussed um, basically a mass spring damper system. Right, and again, um, I'll draw it just one more time in case you haven't seen the video, the previous videos, but again, um, if you've worked with controls or studied controls uh, or dynamic systems or differential equations, this is old hat to you here. So this is what we've got. A mass hooked up to a spring and a damper and we're applying a force to it here. I think what we said last time here was we used a mass of one third, a spring constant of um, four thirds, and a damping ratio, oh, I guess, sorry, I guess maybe we use C instead of B here. I can't, I can never remember our terminology here, but anyway, it's our damping coefficient of one six here, right? So at the end of the day here, you get a transfer function of this thing that looks like three all over S squared plus one half S plus four here, okay? Let's do one small thing. Let's, again, if you remember at the beginning of the video here, we, we had the uh, DC gain of the system be one here. So let's just rescale the output here. So instead of measuring the position as the output, let's measure, I guess, four thirds times the position here. So all I'm gonna do here is do a slight rescale of output. Basically, let's, let's make another transfer function, gs tilde. Again, this, this is really a minor point here. All I'm doing here is making it so the DC gain is one. You should know from your study of dynamic systems that just rescaling the output really doesn't change the damping ratio or your natural frequency. I mean, you can see this, right? The denominator is the same um, in both of these in g and g tilde here. I just wanted to do it so this exactly matches the discussion we just had where we had the DC gain of one here, just so you couldn't, there, there'd be no confusion here, right? Okay, so, um, all right, what we can now do here is basically solve for the uh, damping ratio of natural frequency, right? Because what I wanna do is I wanna write this thing as omega n squared all over s squared plus two zeta omega n s plus omega n squared. Right? So right off the bat, you can basically see from inspection here that omega n in this case is two here, and then just back solving to get what your damping ratio has to be. Your damping ratio in this case comes out to be one eighth. Okay, so this is great. This is clearly less than one over root two here. So we're in this case here where our Bode plot should have this kind of a bump and we should be able to solve for the resonant frequency of the system here, right? Okay, so just plugging it into our expression over here, right? Here's our resonant frequency. You'd basically get a resonance frequency of, let me go ahead and write this down. If you want the exact value, you'd get square root of 31 over two, all this thing divided by two. And this is about, 1.9685 rads per second, okay? So on our Bode plot, um, again, I, I guess here's, here's, our, here's our rough sketch of this thing. Maybe, maybe let's flesh this thing out a little bit here, right? So this is magnitude of G of J omega, and this is omega. So in this case, what we've determined here is that the peak of this system right here where you get maximum deflection here, right? This is, uh, in our case, 1.9685 
rads per second here, right? That's our maximum deflection, right? Okay, and what's interesting here is, again, notice here that, remember, what was our natural frequency here? Our natural frequency was just two rads per second. So you see, there's not a lot of difference here, but there definitely is a numeric difference, right? And furthermore, contrast this with your damped natural frequency here, right? Which we said was omega n times square root of 1 minus zeta squared here, right? So you plug in all of these numbers for our natural frequency and our damping ratio here, and I think what you end up with the damped natural frequency is about 1.9843 rads per second. So again, you see, there's not a lot of difference, but we definitely see that mathematically, omega r is not equal to the natural frequency, which is not equal to your damped natural frequency. So again, in this situation, they're different here. Um, again, this bears a little bit of a discussion here. Maybe we should be very careful here, right? This resonance frequency, this definition that we cooked up earlier as being basically the maximal point of your Bode plot, this is valid for any system, right? So maybe let's make a quick note here. This is a valid, whoops, valid is spelled V-A-L-I-D, valid definition for any system, right? It could be third, fourth, fifth, 90, 100 millionth order system. As long as it has a Bode plot, we're just tra talking about finding the frequency where you have a maximum peak. Now, all of the analysis we did here was only good for a second order system, right? And again, a second order system, you have this concept of natural frequency, right? So maybe we should write here, this is sort of a second order system definition only, right? Because if you have a 20th order system, what, what do you call the natural frequency, right? Do you call that the natural frequency of the dominant poles? But there's also contributions from other poles, et cetera, et cetera, right? Similarly, this damped natural frequency is also sort of a second order system construct only for the, those exact same reasons, right? The system could oscillate at many different frequencies if you have um, uh, higher order systems here. So it's a little bit apples and oranges here, but again, I just wanted to point out here that for this discussion, um, th this is what you end up with, right? They are not all the same here, right? In fact, you can basically see the difference here between our expression for for example, say your damp natural frequency and your and your resonant frequency, right? If we compare this expression with this expression, you can see that there's this factor too. So at low damping ratios, the resonance frequency is similar to the damp natural frequency, but as your damping ratio starts approaching this one over root two here, then you start getting some divergence. Heck, I mean, I think if you were to plot, for example, you look at these two expressions and the only difference is this radical, the thing under the radical. So um, I don't want to go over to Mathematic and do it just because uh, I think it will break our stride here. But if you were to plot the differences in these, maybe let me, um, let me, let me label it. So the y-axis, let's plot here square root of one minus zeta squared minus square root of one minus two zeta squared. Right? Because those are the differences in the uh, damp natural frequency and the resonance frequency term. And plot this versus zeta here, right? So again, we want to stop here at 1 over root 2 because after that, there's no such thing as a resonance frequency anymore here, right? So again, if you plot this, this starts here at 0, but this will go all the way up to like 0 0.7 here. So it, you know, it'll look something like you know, it actually gets worse and worse. So higher and higher, you start getting differences, and it could be as much as 70% different here, right? So this is showing that, again, uh, for our example, they're pretty close, but there are many scenarios where you, you have a non-trivial difference, okay? Maybe before we close this out, let me, let me, we, we looked at the case where, yeah, this system is below critically damped here, but what if you had a system which was more than critically damped here, right? So what if you had a case of zeta was exactly equal to one over root two here? So this is exactly critically damped, right? So again, you plug in your expression for your resonance frequency and you know what you'd end up with? You'd end up with a big fat zero <laughs> here. Okay, so what that's basically implying here is if you think about this long enough here is your Bode plot here of magnitude of G of J omega, right? So here's your amplification versus omega. It's zero here to st at, at low frequencies, at, at, actually at the lowest of frequencies, right? At zero, at a DC input. And then this thing, th there's no max or min here, right? Because uh, the derivative is never equal to zero again. In fact, it just goes down, 
So you get this monotonically decreasing system here, right? So the maximal response is at low frequencies and it just rolls off after that here, right? And this is, is actually exa um, exacerbated here if you have zeta greater than equal to, to critical. So if this was greater than root two, so this is above critically damped, here, right? This actually becomes imaginary here, right? Because if you plug in something greater than one over root two, you get some imaginary expression here. So the slope is not even zero here at the beginning. Maybe I'll do this in another color here, right? That you would basically get something that's, it starts off at zero frequency and it's already rolling off here, right? So again, you get a monotonically decreasing system. So what this is telling you here is for any system that is critically damped or above, the, it never amplifies the, the input, right? It always is attenuating the input signal here, right? Okay, so um, yeah, I think that's a good discussion here on resonance frequency. Before we, we leave you, uh, before I close the video, I, I thought I would want to draw and, and look up a very famous example of this here where there's actually been a lot of controversy um, I live actually in the Pacific Northwest. I think if you watch some of my other videos here, um, I talk a little bit about some geographical relevance to where I live and systems engineering here. And again, like I said, I live in the Pacific Northwest here. And one of the most famous, I think, engineering failures to kind of come out of the Pacific Northwest here is, look up this thing. It's called the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. In fact, I drove over this like two weeks ago when I was going down to Portland here. I actually live somewhat close to this. I'm only about a, yeah, a 45 minute drive away from the Tacoma Narrows Bridge here. This bridge here, um, let's see if I can sketch this here, right? Let's, let's, you know, you have a bridge like this, right? And the car, this is like the car is going in and out of the page here, right? And then you got another car here. Like this, I'm kind of looking at it as the cars drive in and out like this, right? And there's the water down here, et cetera, et cetera. Here, you, there were some, some things to hold it up, right? Now, uh, people talk about this, and, and there's controversy discussing, was this actually destroyed by resonance? In fact, go Google it. You know what? Tell you what, I'll, let, let's just show a video of this real quick here. I'll just show a small video here of this, the bridge here. And you can see that what ended up happening here was one day here, uh, there were significant sustained winds here that were blowing across the bridge, and the bridge started oscillating here, right? And eventually, it oscillated so much that it eventually destroyed itself here, which is kind of what you're seeing right now. So uh, the why this is relevant to this discussion is there's been a lot of controversy over the years. People talk about was it resonance that destroyed this or was it aeroelastic flutter here? Maybe it was a combination of two. And I like to kind of argue that I think you can still make a case for the combination of aeroelastic interactions with uh, this concept of a resonance frequency that we talked about earlier. So what ended up happening here, right, is you would have some wind blowing across here. And what would happen is the bridge would tilt a little bit. It would gain a little bit effectively like an angle of attack here. And it would start shedding vortices here, right, kind of in some kind of pattern. So depending on... Um, uh, the speed of the wind, you would get a different frequency effectively. You, you'd effectively, you'd be exciting the system at different frequencies here, right? So this constant wind would be able to yield a sinusoidal or a periodic excitation to this bridge here, right? Because you can think about this. As this thing gains a little bit of angle attack, it would push back until it eventually comes back and back and back and back. So you would get this aeroelastic excitation. So I still think you can think about this in terms of a resonance uh, discussion here, right? So if you look at the magnitude of G of J omega of this bridge here, right? Sure, there would probably be these modes here, right? And now, if you were to go ahead and get this vortex or this, this vortex shedding slash aeroelastic interaction here to align with one of these resonant freak or one of these peaks here, right? You could get large outputs here for a given uh, input excitation frequency here, right? So a lot of people say, no, it wasn't resonance that, that destroyed this bridge. It was aeroelastic flutter here, but flutter, you can kind of still consider to be some type of frequency response of a system, right? It just happens to still have different types of periodic inputs, which yield large outputs in certain cases here. So again, this is kind of an interesting discussion, which happens to be somewhere close to where I live. So I thought I would just bring this up before we uh, close out the discussion here. So.
With that being said, um, I hope you enjoyed the video here. Please stay tuned. We're going to have a couple more discussions now on um, Bode plots and maybe how to hand sketch them from a given transfer function. And if you did like the video, please like and subscribe. It really helps me continue to make these videos. And I hope to catch you at a future discussion. Until then, I'll talk to you later. Bye.